everybody, and welcome to the second installment of the Castle Bookshop podcast. My name is David Brennan, and along with my parents, I run the Castle Bookshop and MayoBooks.ie based in Castlebar, County Mayo. Today, I'm privileged to be joined by Professor John Breslin and Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley, authors of the best selling book, Old Ireland in Colour. Old Ireland in Colour was or is an absolutely fantastic publication. And from my perspective, as, as kind of a non-expert uh, in, in the field, it's just a really accessible book. It, it's a book that allows one to access and understand history with some wonderful illustrations and pictures uh, and some lovely um, stories behind the pictures as well. Um, I'm really just going to pass you on to, to the two experts now, and, and we're just going to discuss a couple of images from the books and the history behind them. So without further ado, I'm delighted to pass you on to Professor John Breslin and Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley. Thanks, David. Thanks for having us today. It's great to be here with, uh, with you. So um, yeah, we can maybe give some context, I suppose, to the book and, and how it happened, um, if that helps. And uh, we can talk through some of the images, if that works. So uh, um, myself and Sarah Ann, we we uh, we had an email exchange in March of last year about doing a book, and um, you know this has definitely been a book of the pandemic. We haven't actually met myself and Sarah and haven't met in person uh, beforehand, even though we both work in Inuit Galway or, or or since. Although that'll happen hopefully sometime at the end of the year. Um, but uh, you know we we had a fantastic publisher in Mary and Press, and we managed to work very well together virtually, and uh, we, we we produced the book in uh, in October of last year. So. It was quite a rapid turnaround, Sarah, and I think we 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 got it done in about five or six months um, from you know signing our contract to actually getting on the shelves. And again, um, fair play to us and to our publisher for, uh, for, for getting it done. Well, I, I know Connor. I, I know Connor and I in Irish Academic Press as well. I know he's he's delighted with the book, obviously, and, and he speaks very highly of you both. So it's, it's a mutual thing, I suppose. Yeah, I know that, you know, Connor and Pa, our managing editor, uh, Maeve, our marketing person, and Peter O'Connell, who, who also look after the external marketing, all the team there, a great distribution, have been just, you know, fantastic. So it's been a real pleasure to work with them. And um, yeah. And I think just to say that, um, like, it was a quick turnaround, but that's because John had so many amazing, beautiful, color colorized images. So when it came to putting the narrative on it. We had, you know, such a beautiful uh, base there already. Um, and it was great to see something positive come out of lockdown one as well. So <laughs> I think that, you know, for us, we could see something and, you know, the interest has just been uh, fantastic. And I think a lot of it is to do with, um, you know, a real love for public history and, and social history as well. Yeah, and I think also, you know, the book obviously reflects quite a, a long period of Irish history and, you know, the, the huge amount of change that happened in that time. And I guess I sometimes think of it as being, you know, look, at, I suppose, all of the things we've managed to overcome um, over this long period of time. And we are obviously in a very difficult time at the moment, but if we can manage to overcome all of these, um, you know, we, 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 Ireland has changed hugely over that period of time. I think if we, if we can manage to get to where we are today, that surely we can overcome this current uh, crisis as well. Yeah, and it, that's what really struck me. Um, like some of the images from the early 1900s, like you see like sheer destitution, like people living in really rough, rough conditions. And that's not all that long ago. Like to see how far Ireland has come in that short, short space of time. And I think from, from when I, what I've got from reading the book is just, a sheer appreciation of the history. So you have, as, as, as Dr. Sarah Ann said, when you have the, the images kind of coupled with the narrative, it really brings the history to life and, and a reader gets a, a real understanding of it. I really enjoyed it now, I have to say. Oh, thanks, David. Thank you. So will we uh, have a look at some pictures? Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. And actually just talking about the, you know, the, the, the change, I suppose the, the, the picture on the cover, which um, as, as you know, is, is um, a picture of some some uh, some bare feast children. This is from 1946, and you know I, I suppose relatively it's not that long ago. And in fact, we've had some uh, fantastic images of three of the children who are still alive, um, sharing photographs of themselves holding the book. So um, two children here on the uh, not sure is this left or right because I'm looking at my 
image on the screen. Two children over here on the right are um, are, are both in the United States, and then this uh, little chap here is in uh, in Kerry, and we actually just got a picture of him um, a day or two ago, uh, holding a copy of the book. Um, so you know, it, it looks like a different world, but the connection is obviously still very present through through these people. Yeah. There's a bit of advertising, yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> and I think the um, interaction with the people in the book that are still alive has been amazing. And a lot of that is through John and through the social media account, Old Ireland in Colour, but just to see that people kind of feel a big part of this as well. Yeah. yeah. It re really resonates, like, the, you know, the, the reaction to the those people on the cover you know holding a copy of the book and then you know i typically would share it, that picture along with the picture of the person themselves in the past there's something that really just resonates with people they, they love us you know and uh, everyone loves us you know I, I love seeing it myself but it really does i suppose bring you know because again if you saw that picture in isolation you there was something about, about the kind of black and white picture that you know it, it, there's this disconnect and i suppose the coloriz colorization does make them more relatable and then the very fact that there's a link to, you know, the present day makes it even more relatable. So I think that's uh, that's that's kind of part of it. And, you know, maybe even just the, the fact that these pictures are being highlighted suddenly brings new facts or, you know, facts that were kind of dormant to, to, to life as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe we can share a couple of images if that's OK. And I have yeah, that. Brilliant. Brilliant. I have a selection here from from Mayo, given uh, given where you are and um, uh, Let's start with maybe one of the earlier ones. So, okay. So, hopefully, you can see this first picture, which is um, a very famous male gentleman by the name of William Brown or Guillermo Brown. I don't know if I've got that. Uh, yeah, I, think, I think Guillermo Brown. Yeah, he'd be probably going by that at this stage. Yeah, pronunciation correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, th this is one of the older images in the book. It's actually from 1857. So uh, the very, you know, the very first type of of um, of image, or, sorry, a photograph was 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 from 1939, and that's the daguerreotype. And this is a you know a, a later instance of a daguerreotype, but still obviously very early in in, in that it's from the the 1850s. Um, and uh, William Brown was born actually in 1777. So again, you know. When I look at some of these images and think of you know how far back we're actually going to in terms of birth dates, um, we have another book we recently shared on social media. Or sorry, another picture we recently shared on social media of um, Miles O'Brien who fought in in um, in the 1798 rebellion. Um, you know, I think it's it's amazing that we actually have pictures of these people captured on on, on photographic um, in photographic form. So, um, you know, as you know, William Brown was born in, in, in Foxford. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and there's a huge, obviously, there will be a big awareness of, of William Brown in, in Mayo. Um, yeah. But I, like the, the Argentine Navy have, are, are over, re, you know, regularly enough. They were, they were in Mayo a couple of years ago to mark um, an anniversary of his death, I think. And you know a huge yeah. mark. You know he's he's a very significant figure in both in both um, Ireland and and Argentina. And I guess and I know it's, I'm sure you've heard it said, but a picture paints a thousand words. When you see a picture here of Admiral Brown in front of you, it, it I find it very striking. I have to say, and knowing a little bit about the man, um, it does kind of it it kind of triggers all these thoughts and you know all these things you would have heard and, and just to see him. And it's a, it's an, an amazing image when you consider how old it is. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic to see. I think as well, like we think of the Irish diaspora often as the 19th century and, you know, this is like 18th century immigration yeah. and he's of maybe a different class than we would associate. And I think it just brings a broadness to, to kind of what we think. And we wanted that section on the Irish abroad because the Irish abroad has been just, you know, a huge part of our, our national history. And so I think that section is quite interesting in the book because it shows the influence that people had of all social classes, gender, you know, it's really diverse, yeah. but you can really kind of, you know, see it in, in this instance, I think. And, you know, we said the father of the Argentine Navy, he, he's known yes. as, which is, you know, some claim for, a boy that left Ireland at the age of nine, I guess. 
Yeah, and it was like a crazy trip down to Argentina going through Mississippi and working on both. It was, you know, a crazy life. And to end up, as you said, yeah, the founder of the Argentine Navy is amazing. And to see him here in all his glory, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, if I remember when I colorized this, I would have looked at you know, various uh, paintings of, of Admiral Brown because, you know, again, being such a prominent figure in Argentina, there would have been many painted pictures of him as well to kind of get an idea of the colors of, of uniforms. And I suppose like with, with a lot of these pictures, you know, there's a, there's a whole story, not just, you know, in terms of the person, but their, their life and then the greater, um, you know, the, the greater, let's say, ecosystem that they, they, they existed in. And somebody sent me this book um, from the Admiral Brown uh, Society in, in Mayo. Um, it was a guy called Alan Lonergan, which is, you know, William Brown, liberator of the, the, South, the South Atlantic and um, translated into English. So, Again, you know, I, I think these pictures are like an entry point into um, huge amounts of, of related information and stories that there, there will be on, on, on these individuals. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's William Brown. Let's see who's next. I don't remember the order of these, but um, we'll, we'll have a surprise um, picture coming up. Um, yeah, this one is from Minish Bigel in, in, uh, in also in County Mayo. And it's a, you know, a very striking image of uh, a gramophone um, arriving on the island and uh, um, everybody listening to this uh, voice coming out of this artificial machine, which must have been uh, an, an interesting uh, sight, yeah. but also an interesting audio experience. Yeah, well, you're, you're capturing probably the first time most of these people have seen a gramophone or heard a gramophone. I would imagine that's the impression one gets when you're looking at the image. And just the sheer, I suppose, what a revolution it would have been or what a change to have this introduced into their lives. It actually, you nearly feel, as a, you know, you nearly feel like you're intruding on a private moment amongst these men or friends. Uh, it was on, it's on English Spiegel, isn't it, John? It is. It is, yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's, yeah it's, it's absolutely fantastic, yeah. Like, what an image. It, it, like, it, yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. And what and I an think impressive gramophone. Really on the head, David, like when we have these new technologies, like we don't often get to capture that in a photograph. So this is obviously like we can kind of date this from 1900 to 1930 because that's when gramophones were available in Ireland. But um, there's, you know, there's different kind of details there, but there's definitely yeah, a feeling from this uh, of a kind of inclusive moment. And it's something that, you know, and I think like the the kids just kind of sitting there in awe at this as well. So um, I think it, it's a great shot. And um, it's obviously we can see from people's clothing and that, you know, you know what class they're from. And and that's kind of how how John goes at the the his work. And, you know, I think that's really important as well. Yeah, it's like a natural a natural auditorium there that they're all kind of just gathered around. Yeah, it's it's really really good. And I guess awesome. in in terms of in, in terms of how you know that, that to me that's a perfect illustration of just you see, you don't even need to be reading really, even though the 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 text accompanying all the images is very helpful. But if you just sit down and think about that image and think about what you're seeing, you know, you can kind of nearly make up the history yourself, which is, you're probably not meant to do that, but it, it does It does add to the fun of reading the book, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah. You can almost kind of imagine, well, what, what would the records yeah. be that they would be listening to on that? Like, would it have been, um, is this kind of pre-John McCormick or is it kind of around that sort of era, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, again, you can see, you can read more into, like, obviously, you've got the barefoot children um, and then you've, you're kind of observing types of clothes. These also will be, Quite similar to, to the clothes they would have had in 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 Aaron kind of around the same time um because there are um as far as i remember this this image is from the national folklore collection and there are records in the national folklore collection of um of types of clothes that people wore and colors and so on that would have been hand drawn around that same time so you can have a i suppose a you can be reading lots into in, into this picture you know is that kind of a table that people are sitting on in the middle and uh you know, you can see kind of there's a, uh, seems to be a small box open there besides the, um, the gramophone, which is probably what the record was in and so on. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So uh, next we have another uh, fa famous person with a, a male connection, and this is uh, Grace Kelly. So um, as you probably know, Grace had uh, ancestral connections to, to Mayo, and, uh, you know, formally, I suppose, she, she visited, I think it was three or four times, 
But um, there were many other visits that she would have made to Mayo. And uh, I was uh, saying recently that um, she, my understanding is she, she bought the family home in the late 1970s in, in Mayo and, and some adjoining um, farmland. I'm not sure, you know, subsequently what's, what's, um, what's happened to that, but um, I guess there was a, you know, obviously a, a strong connection that she came back and, and, and bought that. Um, and, you know, even when I was doing some research into, into her, I didn't realize that her father was, uh, you know, a, a, a winning, uh, a medal winning sports person, you know, you kind of start to kind of build up a bigger picture in terms of, of the connections. And I think it was her grandparents or great grandparents that came from, 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 from Mayo originally. Um, and, you know, again, a strong connection to Ireland to this day. I know that her, her son uh, often, often visits and they establish a scholarship in, in Trinity um, from, from, from the Rainier family. Yeah, it's, it's just, just outside Newport in County Mayo is the, is the home, home place. And Prince Albert, I think, formerly visited a couple of years ago, all right, as well. Yeah. So, yeah, there's still, still, still strong Mayo connections there. Yeah, and so lots of, I remember many visits, uh, photographs of many visits she made to Connemara as well, um, wearing uh, the, you know, the, the you know, Connemara uh, tweed jackets and, and she, uh, again, had some, had some great visits there. And I know the various tour guides in Connemara will highlight the various places she would have visited on the Of course, they yeah. I think there's a picture of her uh, maybe catching fish or something from a boat um, on one of those trips, but um, yeah. Very good, yeah, very good. Well, Let's see who's next. Now, this isn't in, in Mayo, but it's near enough to Mayo that I thought it might be interesting to to uh, include it. And actually, coincidentally, I think it was uh, yesterday um, Irish Reading Day or Irish Readers Day. Um, there was a, a senator shared out a picture of of the Old Iron Colour Book, and he specifically picked out this picture because um, it was a place that he 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 liked to visit when he was able to to travel. Um, so this is Linan on the near near to the Galway uh, Mayo border, and you know those familiar with Linan driving through it will uh, will will recognise obviously the scenery in the background, but the the foreground has 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 changed uh, quite quite a bit since then. Um, this will be from the the National Library of Ireland from from the Lawrence collection. Yeah, it's still like I you know knowing that it's Lena and the bridge is still there, and you know that 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 main street is it's still kind of retained a little bit of that character, I suppose. It obviously is that much bigger. What date is this photo from, John? Or do you do you know? Well, the, the, I suppose the, the issue with the Lawrence collection is that the records in terms of when the photographs were taken were destroyed uh, around this, you know, around the time of the revolution and and, and the rising. So uh, the Lawrence collection was. You know that their main offices were were on Sackville Street um, or Connell Street, and uh, unfortunately, the office was largely destroyed in in, in fires yeah. at the time. But the the negatives were kept offsite, and therefore most of these images, unless somebody can you know date them, for example, there's a couple of images that might have I don't know some kind of very characteristic thing where you can say this building was built after a certain time and so on. They're they're roughly dated from let's say the 1880s, maybe even back as far as 1870, mid 1860s. Okay. Up to okay. 19, 10, 1914. So it's quite a broad range, but um, you know there are a lot of people who do um, try, you know, efforts in terms of trying to pinpoint stuff. So, for example, in this this one here, if you zoom in, you can see names on over the bars. So I can see a gainer here, for example, on on one of the the, the on one of the bars over the door, and I can see maybe O'Connell or O'Donnell. So what people do is they they might use the census records to find out when a particular proprietor or publican was. In residence in a particular location they can say well actually you know gainer wasn't there until 1911 and therefore it's in 1901 to 1911. Ah, okay okay I don't detective detective work, so. yeah there's a bit of work there which is fun as yeah. well you know yeah yeah you get maybe a local from lena might be able to might be able to um patch that together so that can be a challenge yeah, we kind of said around 1900 we were hedging our bets there okay. so we said around 1900 okay. but as John was saying, like it was really important to us that the national collections, like um, the Lawrence collection and a lot of the collections in the National Library would get attention because of the book as well. And I think that has been the case and they have, you know, worked very well with us. So um, it just shows you, I guess, the amazing collections that we have as well um, that people may not have been aware of with some of them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Or I know they're probably accessible online, but 
I suppose that's the beauty of a book like this. It puts them all in a, in a wonderfully presented package, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about, I suppose, you know, the, 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 the pathway that these things go from, obviously from the camera that, you know, a lot of these pictures in the Lawrence collection would have been taken by a guy called Robert French. And he took roughly three quarters of the collection, um, the, the entire collection, which is tens of thousands of, of, of photographs. Um, and he traveled around Ireland, you know, taking these. So, uh, you know, I'll show you after I've gone through these images, I suppose, just a typical uh, glass plate negative to see, you know, so you can see what, what, what it looks like. Um, yeah. But, you know, I suppose even just thinking about, you know, light hitting negative, negative, you know, being transported to different places, eventually being acquired by National Library of Ireland, being digitized, scanned onto their website, shared out on. It's an amazing kind of life cycle, even in terms of those images. And, and the detail on these is just absolutely amazing. And like, as you, as you zoom in and you start seeing, you know, I can see probably a little child here in the middle and there's somebody here standing, you know, beside the doorway. Yeah. They're just, yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're like super high resolution images. Yeah. Um, so, Here's a, another uh, a person with a Mayo connection known as uh, Maggie from Mayo. And um, Maggie was one of Ireland's most famous um, opera singers. Yes, um, yes. Margaret Burke Sheridan, yes. She was just born just up the road from the sh from the shop, actually, on the Mall. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So is, there any, she... um, is there any plaque or anything there? Or will there, there should be? There is, like, yeah, there is a plaque. Yeah, there is a plaque. And a local author called Anne Chambers wrote a book on her and has done quite a lot, actually, in kind of keeping her history alive okay. so yeah yeah she'd be yeah she'd be pretty high profile in Casper. they actually had a, a wonderful um concert a couple of of years ago in the local it's the local town hall i guess they got an opera singer down and sang a lot of the songs she would have sang it was a wonderful evening actually yeah so yeah margaret brooke Sheridan. yeah it's, i don't i've never seen a picture like that though it's it kind of really shows her in full flight, I guess, her character and, you know, her mannerisms. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Brilliant. yeah. So, yeah. From, I think it's from Germany. Um, it was, it was, uh, the, the, the man is a, an Italian conductor. Um, and um, I found this picture on, on Wikipedia originally. But, um, you know, again, I, I think what's interesting is the impact that she had on obviously, you know, obviously in the world of opera, but also on even the composers of opera, like Puccini, who, you know, she would have sang uh, various, um, in, in various of his productions. She was in uh, Madame, Madame Butterfly. He was said to have been spellbound by her. So, you know, those things always really resonate with me where you can say, well, here's an Irish person who, you know, was uh, obviously um, went and, and made a name for themselves in the world. But then also, I suppose, see the broader impact on, you know, for example, on Puccini. Or, or somebody yeah. else is, is just amazing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, sometimes, like, we might know in our local areas of someone, like, I, I can imagine that she is very well known in Mayo and in the, but may not be known nationally as, as well. And it's a kind of, it's a place to be able to highlight that, I guess. Um, and she obviously, is incredibly uh, yeah. cheeky in this. I think yeah, it's a great yeah. photograph because I think her, as you say, her personality is is coming across there. Um, and, you know, I'd say she would have been a very interesting woman to, to share yeah, a glass I'd with. Say so. <laughs> I'd say she had a few stories to tell. She was a superstar of her day. And you're you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I don't know that she'd be known really outside of Castle Bar, you know, maybe obviously within singing circles or whatever, but yeah, she's well known, fortunately, in her hometown. And there seems to be road, road. Which is brilliant, yeah. And hopefully a bit better yeah. known now nationally yeah. and, and internationally. And there's a guy who looks like Ronan Keating in the background. I was just actually looking at the book. He's not in the book. We, we must have cut him out, but um, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. But no, it's a fantastic, a fantastic image, you know. It's just one of those kind of, you know, you wonder what was the photographer doing there at the time, you know. And uh, just they managed yeah, to Yeah, a real private it. moment, isn't it? Another real private moment. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Another one from from Lean Ann, and uh, again, it's a real, uh, you know, snapshot into the past. Um, uh, I've kind of gone for muted enough colors here, but did try to kind of add at least some red to one of the the shawls here of the women. And you know, I suppose there's a lot of photographs from the west of Ireland of people wearing, you know, red, brown, um, sometimes blue colors. And um, but yeah, it's a great image. Like, look at those balls of wool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, it's an image like this that I, I was referring to initially, like that isn't all that long ago. 
that the man would it be 120 years ago max maybe and it just looks like yeah, oh, yeah it's yeah it's around the 1890s yeah. Yeah. yeah it's amazing to think but but i think it shows us an industry that you know obviously was really important to the area um I suppose sometimes as well, it makes us reflect. You can see like they're not exactly smiling in the photograph. It is very much they are posing for this. Um, and, you know, that's what we see. Like sometimes when we're looking at the photographs, it's obviously also, you know, as John said in regards to Maggie from Mayo, who is the photographer? And then what's the relationship between the photographer and the subjects there? Um, and I think that in this, it's very much they are, you know, showing their industry but they're obviously the workers in it and they're staying quite, quite somber really in it. Yes, very formal. Yeah, you're, when you say it, yeah, absolutely, it's very apparent now. Yeah. Um, and many, many of these photographs, again, they were told to stay still because of exposure times, you know, so um, <clears throat> we often kind of think, well, why were people so serious back then? But again, a lot of it, you know, there are a small number of, of pictures of people smiling, but, you know, it's hard to keep that smile going, I suppose, for, 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 uh, for, for a period oh, yeah. of time. So, um, we would have, yeah. yeah, and sorry, that was 1902 to 1914. Okay. And, you know, the business itself, it had, you know, around 300 employees. So it was a big employer at the time as well. So in the area. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's these snapshots of industries that, you know, would have been really important to, to different localities. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have another picture in the book from Guidor and it's, you know, the, again, there's a lot of people in the picture and, you know, they're, um, they're looking quite serious and they're all holding their hands in what looks like kind of a, a praying fashion, but they seem to be holding knitting needles. So they were obviously, you know, part, knit, you know, part of the knitting industry at the time and probably told to, you know, keep their hands like this to keep still for, for the photograph. But um, again, you know, a snapshot into to, to an industry of the time. Um, so here's another uh, famous um, uh, picture of, of uh, well, a famous person and, and a famous picture. This picture was taken by a very well-known photographer in the US called, um, uh, um, <laughs> I'm sure I've got the right photographer because I'm gonna mix up between the two. This is either by Nadar or Saroni. Um, and I think it's by Saroni, yes, yeah, by Saroni, sorry. Um, so Roni took uh, pictures of all of the kind of celebrities, you know, politicians, uh, actresses, actors from, from, from theatre um, at the time. And uh, I was just kind of laughing to myself because it, the, the caption says um, um, Michael Davish with missing arm shown. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're commenting, well, you know, obviously the, it, it's the missing arm has shown. But uh, you know, yeah. again, this this is something I you know, you know I would have studied obviously history in school like a lot of people never really would have known a lot about Michael Davis and certainly not the fact that he had lost um, a, a, an arm at, at a young age, but um, yeah, as I say, um, it's a very kind of striking uh, photograph of of Davis and you know there's got the little sign there saying Land League and um, the land for the poor, um, just the bottom part of that's cut off. So um, again. Uh, I think an interesting picture that even just the, the you know the coat and the kind of clothes you can see sort of the steam in in in, in the middle of it, and this is likely taken in 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 New York because that's where Soroni had his studio. And I suppose obviously, and you probably need to tell very few people in Mayo about Michael Davis, but um, my colleague in the university. Uh, uh, Lawrence uh, is actually, you know, he's written quite a lot, but I think it was important for us as well to, I suppose, make sure that like stories that and figures that really had a huge impact on, on the 19th, 20th century, obviously the Land League and, you know, what goes on in the late 19th century with the land wars. I'd say I'm out, yeah. guys. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, I'm only getting little clips okay. in between the discussion. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, I, I guess that picture shows once again the significance and the you know the huge impact that that Irish people and I'm going to fly the Mayo flag now that a Mayo person has had internationally and you know no better example I would feel than Michael Davis um, for all for all he achieved. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, again, um, I discovered that uh, you know some of uh, Davis' descendants are still in Irish politics again. So when you're 
you know, um, doing the, the pictures and you're, you're sharing them out, suddenly you find out, you know, stuff about, for example, in, in the book, we have um, some pictures of Maud Gan, and uh, I think it's her great granddaughter um, was on Twitter kind of talking about Maud Gan and sharing the colorized pictures. So it's amazing, I suppose, the connections that percolate through to, to, to the current day in terms of descendants. And of course, you hear more than about the history from, from, from them as well. So, um, yeah, next picture is uh, it, it's it's a picture picture from Ackle. Actually, the next two pictures are both from Ackle, and um, again, just a very striking image. You know, I think in in many respects, people are obviously drawn to the scene and focusing on things like her foot looks quite sore um, on, on 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 the foot on the stone there in the water, um, and then she's got her bucket and she's obviously drawing water from this uh, the source. But um, you know, it, it's it's uh, it, it, it's an interesting image. It's from a, what's called a stereograph, and the stereographs were they were they were kind of like the three D images of, of of the day because um, basically what happened was somebody had a special camera that took two pictures at the same time, a left and a right view, and uh, they produce these little cards, which I'm going to hold one up to the screen here so you can see it on my camera, and I'll show you again later on. But the the cards basically have two pictures taken at the same time, a left and a right view. And then there's usually some kind of text on the back about um, what they were about. So you have the special viewer, which is essentially just like a pair of spectacles with a stick. And then you, you, you place the, the stereograph at the end of the stick. And it gave you a, a 3D perspective as you looked um, at the two images at the same time, because one is you know, focused on one eye and the other is focused on the other eye. Um, so this is half of, of a stereograph. So again, this would have been part of a a card that would have been inserted into these stereograph viewers and you know they're hugely popular um amongst the irish diaspora because you know they obviously there was a huge amount of emigration after after the famine and um i suppose they just you know people didn't travel back and forth as, as regularly then they wanted to have views of home there were many many black and white stereographs produced and then there were also at the time colorizations produced where people would paint over the the um the pictures Sometimes not altogether convincingly because it looked maybe a bit, um, uh, you know, garish colors or colors that wouldn't have been used. But again, they just tried to bring them more to life by um, by by adding that color. Um, and that's for me was interesting as well because you know colorization. I'm kind of thinking of it in a modern sense because of the book and so on. But this has been going, you know, colorization has been going on till since 1840, since the advent of photography. So people have uh, have often wanted to see these scenes in color. So. Um, that that's one of the two images from 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 Ackle, which I was going to show you. Yeah, well, the the colorization obviously, from, from a lay person's perspective, obviously you you have a huge understanding of, of the technical side of it, but it just brings it to life and and makes it a lot more. You know, you can associate with with it more. You can see your facial expressions in a little bit more detail. You get a feel for her surroundings, and then again, you kind of thoughts begin to percolate. What was her life like? She was going around in harsh conditions, obviously no shoes, drawing water there from what looks like some sort of a well. You see the thatched yeah. cottage in the background, like life was not easy. You know, sometimes we have a rosy, well, I'd be guilty of it sometimes, but I have a rosy view of, of life back in Ireland in the 1900s, a simpler life, but it was definitely a harder life as well. Absolutely. You, know, when you see that. Yeah. And... Like even the kind of the water and, you know, the, you can almost see kind of reflections or textures of the water. I, you know, I find it amazing really that again, I, I was talking about the life cycle of a photograph earlier on, kind of going from, you know, the person taking the picture through to, to this version here, despite the fact it's gone through so many mediums. And, you know, this came from the uh, Library of Congress in the US where they would have scanned in a lot of these stereographs. I find it kind of amazing that you can have almost kind of, you know, realistic looking water coming out the other end, considering this was taken on, taken on a camera. There was some negative produced. It was printed onto some, you know, onto some cars like this as, as a photograph. Then somebody scanned it in, and eventually down the road, it's um, it, it, it looks it looks quite real. Um, this one, the quality isn't as good, but it's still a very very interesting photograph. And one I had some help from a colleague, uh, Matt Lockery, who's based in Mayo. He runs a company called My Colorful Past, and he does uh, just amazing work. He does a, a series of images at the moment for RT on the War of Independence in color. And um, anyway, this is, a, a, again, a very um, interesting picture of the two women carrying turf. And um, you can see, obviously, the cottage in the background. And I remember, you know, choosing red for some clothes here and green for making sure there's kind of green in the, in the hills in the background. But again, this is half of, of a stereograph. So you can actually see just a little portion of it on the, 
on the other side of the page there where you can imagine it being viewed on a stereograph viewer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just see that there now. Yeah. And again, these people were, were well, well, well attuned to hard work by the looks of things, you know, carrying turf on their back like that. Yeah. And yeah. yeah actually, yeah. <laughs> A few people are warning were, were these the, the same person, you know, that there is some, uh, you know, kind of similarity between this woman here and the woman on the left. Um, and I, oh, I don't yeah, know, if there's, yeah. no, there's no names on the photographs, but again, I suppose, you know, there's characteristic clothes that a lot of people wore. Obviously, this person's wearing boots, the other person was, was barefoot. Um, I think they were taken in different parts of, of, of the island, but again, Ackle isn't that big, so conceivably it could be, could be the same person. But yeah, so I was going to show you just one or two of these, uh, I suppose, um, pictures and uh, just, I suppose, to kind of show where these came from. And I know I've kind of flashed this up on the screen a, a few times in terms of the, the stereographs there. But this is a, let me see if I can take off the plastic bag here to give you a better view of it. This is a stereograph taken in uh, in Galway and um, it's from Air Square. It feels like I'm unwrapping a present here, <laughs> wrapped up in plastic. Um, so. The, as I say, you know, the stereographs were, 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 were hugely popular and um, but also quite detailed, you know, so you can see this is a, a fair in, in a, as it says there, the Haymarket in Galway. Let me just turn off the light. That might reflect a little bit better or worse. Um, and I shall turn it until I can see the text. Um, actually, it was better with the light on. But you, you, can, uh, you can see detail there, I suppose, in, in, in terms of those, um, those scenes. There we go, nice and sharp. And as I say, you know, there are basically two two pictures being taken at the same time um, from slightly different angles, although you know, the, the camera was, you know, in the same spot, but the camera lenses were pointed slightly different angles from each other. And it does produce a, a very interesting 3D effect when you um, when you view them. And actually, I've taken a couple of these pictures and animated them so that it looks like you're kind of moving from from left to right. Um, you can basically do a kind of a morph between the two pictures that, you know, you know, basically looks like it's kind of getting 3D effects by by moving from one image to the other. Um, and the other thing I want to show you is a old glass plate negative. I'm supposed to show you kind of uh, what these things look like. And I have to put on my special white gloves here to 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 touch it um, because this is from the, getting, the, things are getting the, serious. Now, so all, it's yeah. a serious thing, yeah. And uh, if you told me this time last year that I would be putting on white gloves to show you a photograph on a video on a Zoom call, I'd be kind of saying, yeah, right. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so this is, uh, again, you, you can't see it because it's just reflecting the screen, but this shows you the size, I suppose, at least of, of, of the glass plate and exits. Like they're quite sizable. Um, you know, this one's about, uh, about 20 centimeters by 15, you know, they're quite sizable um, uh, pictures. And as I say, you know, as we saw in some of those Lawrence images, the, the detail on them is quite quite something when you, when you zoom in. Well, yeah, and when you see that, I suppose the end result is that However many years on, hundreds, you know, hundreds of years, well, 150 years on or whatever it might be in the oldest, in the oldest photos, um, we're still able to enjoy them. And we're so lucky that, that, we, that, that they've been preserved and that we have them. And, and we're so lucky that, you know, that, dare I say it, John, that they've been put together in such a wonderful book like your, your, the book yourself and Sarah, Sarah Anne have put together. Um, you know, it, it makes history and, and the photos, you know, really accessible and really enjoyable. And uh, so congratulations much. again. Congratulations again. Thank you, Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, so I, I think that kind of draws it to a natural conclusion. Um, I have to say, I really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I, I got so much from it. And, and I hope you, the listeners or the viewers, will also uh, enjoy it and get, and get a lot from our discussion. A huge thank you to Professor John Breslin and to D Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley for joining us today. Uh, and we're delighted to, to have been able to host this and we, we intend on hosting plenty more podcasts on the road. The book is available in our shop, The Castle Bookshop, and also on our website, mayobooks.ie. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Pleasure. Thank you. Great.